This is Democracy in Lockdown, a weekly virtual conversation on the latest news about the coronavirus crisis and what it means for our democracy. This podcast is presented by Unlock Democracy. We campaign for a better democracy and a new written constitution built and owned by the people. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Democracy in Lockdown podcast. My name is Sam and I'm the campaigns officer at Unlock Democracy. I've also got here with me today, Matthew. How are you doing, Matthew? Yeah, I'm not too bad, Sam. Thanks. Good stuff. So um, unfortunately, it's the two men on a podcast show again today. I have some spring allergies that struck down some other members of our team, but we hope that that's not going to um, happen too often. We've heard some news recently that in England, shops are going to be allowed to open again from the middle of June. So Matthew, how do you feel about that idea of you know, not relying on Amazon anymore and being able to browse around with lots of other bodies. I mean, we know each other fairly well, Sam, and, and you know that I won't be too upset if I don't have to rely on Amazon. But um, I don't know about opening the shops. I'm still feeling quite quite tentative. And I suppose it's it's partly a lack of information. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what to think about how safe it is, um, you know, what that means for my health, but what that means for, for other people as well. I want it to be done in, in the correct way. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure I'm um, ambivalent, but certainly looking forward to being able to to, to go elsewhere. Yeah, um, here in Wales, it's obviously a different set of regulations and I don't think the same timeline is really on the cards there. But yeah, I'm just really concerned that with people being distracted by the Dominic Cummings saga at the moment, we're not paying attention to the stats that are showing that the daily rate of infection in the UK is still going up quite a lot faster than some of the other European countries that were really at the peak before we are. So yeah, I would really want to see more about what the science is saying about that before those sorts of measures are kicking in. So last week, my colleague Sarah and I talked about the hidden decision makers that have been shaping the government's response to COVID-19. And we discussed the real life consequences um, of those political choices that are made overwhelmingly by a handful of very, very powerful people. We also touched on lobbying, private donations, and companies' multi-million pound contracts that they have often been winning without a competitive process during the crisis. So this week, we'll be talking about the impact of the pandemic on migrant workers and how the government's structural and systemic decisions have real impacts on migrant communities. We'll be hearing from Dolores Modern from the Latin American Women's Rights Service, who's been working with London's Latin American community. Stay with us. Okay, so the news this week has been dominated um, by the case of a certain Dominic Cummings. Um, Dominic Cummings, who is a special advisor to the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, was in the news last weekend after he refused to resign um, after travelling 260 miles from London to Durham because his wife experienced COVID-19 symptoms. On top of that, knowing that his wife might have had COVID-19, he then came into contact with officials at Number 10 Downing Street. Boris Johnson said that Cummings acted reasonably, legally and with integrity and with care for his family and others. But there's loads of public confusion over lockdown measures and these statements have left all of us asking whether it is one rule for us and another for those who make the rules themselves. We've also seen the emergence of a new alliance of representatives from farming, consumer and environmental and animal welfare organisations. They're coming together to amend the agriculture bill and they're looking to ensure that it secures vital safeguards um, for high standards of food safety, animal welfare and environmental protection that we know the public values so highly. And these have some really high profile signatories, including the NFU, the RSPB, National Trust, Friends of the Earth and the Tenant Farmers Association. They published a letter stating that the agriculture bill lacks any formal requirement to uphold British farming production standards as we negotiate trade deals and in our general trade policy. Unfortunately, their amendment was defeated, but there was an unusually high number of rebellions from the Conservative backbench, which shows that putting pressure on parliamentarians can have an impact, even when there is such a large Conservative majority in the Commons. Boris Johnson's first liaison committee was selected, and the liaison committee in Parliament is one of the basic structures that MPs have 
that can hold the Prime Minister to account. After controversially installing his own preferred chair of the committee, Sir Bernard Jenkins, it's come to light that the Prime Minister will only face 20 minutes of coronavirus-related questioning in front of the committee, including about Dominic Cummings. It is the only immediate parliamentary opportunity to grill Johnson over Cummings, as the meeting is taking place during recess. Two of Boris Johnson's highest profile critics in Parliament, Tom Tugendat and Tobias Elwood, have been excluded from that meeting. If you like this podcast, click the subscribe button and follow us on social media. We're recording this on Wednesday morning, the morning after we had a democracy gathering session with Mini Rahman from the Joint Council for the Welfare of immigrants and we just wanted to have a bit of a chat about some of the reflections from that talk last night and thinking about how that is relevant to the discussion that we're going to have later on. So what inspired me most about Minnie's talk was this idea that there's a new public since the pandemic that while it was relatively easy for the government to just ratchet up anti-migrant rhetoric and things like the hostile environment wouldn't notice that badly before. That's now become much more difficult where the furor we've seen over the NHS surcharge for health workers and care workers has been a really big example of that. And she seemed to really think that there's now quite a big opportunity to get people to think more broadly about the way that we're talking about immigrants. And that's wrapped up as well in the rebranding, shall we say, of unskilled work where we realise it's actually just low paid work and that these jobs are actually some of those essential things in reproducing life and keeping people safe in our society. She also talked about some victories that had been uh, secured on the immigration bill. One of them is the abolishment of the NHS surcharge for certain groups of migrants. And another thing that I think is really important to reflect on is the way in which class dynamics are really emphasised and reproduced um, with migrants if we're talking about things like the hostile environment because not only is working illegal in the UK a criminal offence at the moment which means that you can be deported that means that you're much more liable to being exploited by your employers you're not going to access a union you're not going to get the support from them and that's probably going to undermine wage rates as well as well if you're not in a situation to get work through quote-unquote legal means. So as Sam said earlier we're going to be talking to Dolores Modden from the Latin American Women's Rights Service and we're going to be talking to Dolores about the hostile environment and how it's been intensified during this crisis. But let's look first a bit at the history of the hostile environment concept. The term hostile environment first came about in 2012 um, when the Home Secretary of the time, Theresa May, popularised the idea of forcing out migrants who didn't have proper, proper documentation and put in place cruel measures um, with the aim of further deterring migrants um, from entering the United Kingdom. This developed into government policy through immigration acts in 2014 and 2016, and it included a raft of measures to prevent people from accessing fundamental rights and basic services, including employment, healthcare, housing, education, banking, and, and so on. During that time, the government really ramped up a culture of fear in migrant communities, They drove vans that read, go home through um, migrant neighbourhoods. They checked documents at schools and hospitals. And long-term workers and residents um, have been deported from the United Kingdom, often having lived here for decades. During this pandemic especially, a public apology from the government um, to the Windrush generation, um, based on findings from the Windrush report, was swept under the rug and published at a time when the government knew that it would fall down the news agenda. The government's hostile environment policy has also emboldened right-wing media to attack various other communities, including Roma and Irish traveller groups, who have been featured on highly critical uh, television documentaries, including Channel 5's Gypsies on Benefits and Proud. And this has extended to attacking some of the most vulnerable people uh, in our society. In 2020, the immigration bill Um, that was passed through Parliament just last week will repeal EU free movement of persons and other related EU derived rights in UK law and it is said that this bill paves the way for the introduction of a points based migration system. The bill provides the government incredible powers to impose the rules through secondary legislation and so ministers will be able to rewrite our immigration system from scratch. 
And so it is in this context that we're going to be hearing from Dolores Modern from the Latin American Women's Rights Service on how all of this has affected um, the women they work with. Welcome, Dolores. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. So could you start off briefly by telling us what the Women's Rights Service does and what you do with them in terms of looking after people's workers' rights? Yeah, of course. Um, so my role at LORS is, uh, as you said, I'm policy and comms coordinator on employment rights. So I do policy and advocacy work, which is essentially trying to influence decision makers and effect change. Um, for our organization in particular, what that means is raising the issues that the Latin American community is experiencing. Um, because we're quite an invisible minority in the UK and doing quite invisible jobs like cleaning hospitality and domestic work. So uh, our struggles are very much unknown. Um, or I should say, to be fair, and at this point, unknown by some and purposely ignored by others. Um, and what LORS does is, uh, besides policy and advocacy, we provide a whole range of um, frontline services like support for women experiencing violence and domestic abuse, support with uh, welfare benefits and debt advice, counselling in Spanish and Portuguese, uh, employment rights advice, legal advice on family law and immigration, and a few of other things. Great stuff, thanks. So could you tell us a bit more about the kinds of issues that's been propping up during the pandemic so far, and particularly if you've been doing any work on the immigration bill that's been going through Parliament recently? Sure, yeah. Um, the issues that have been coming up lately, um, so I should, I should say first that our service users tend to work in quite vulnerable um, situations, um, in quite precarious employment, I would say. Uh, and since the pandemic started, what we've been seeing is, for example, women who are still working, obviously, because they, they are key workers, um, but who are doing more hours for the same pay. So for example, they're having to cover for, for colleagues who are either on furlough or on sick leave or whatever, and they're, and they're having to do their work but not being paid ex any extra for it. Um, women who, as we've been seeing in the media, who are not being given any PPE, any protective equipment, uh, despite requesting it and despite working in, in public spaces, for example. Um, we've seen domestic workers who are perhaps the most invisible of all of them, uh, who, are, who are made uh, or asked to move in with their employers during lockdown, but threatened with dismissal if they, if they don't want wow. to. Um, things like that. And women who are not paid statutory sick pay. So what that means essentially is that if they, if they display symptoms of COVID-19, they essentially have to choose between their health and their, and their salary. Uh, and we've, not, we've, we've heard from women who have gone to work with symptoms, which means their employers are not only endangering their workers, but they're, they're also endangering public health as well uh, by potentially transmitting the, the virus uh, or helping spread the virus. And we've, ha and we've seen service users also who have lost their incomes uh, as a result of COVID-19, women who have been dismissed or had their hours cut rather than, than put on furlough, women who, because of the school closures, had suddenly um, caring responsibilities that they were not uh, counting on and they, and they weren't able to go to, to work and earn the money that they need to, to survive. Um, this is particularly concerning in the cases of women who have no recourse to public funds. Um, so in case some of your listeners don't know, some visas, um, some, to, some migrants visas have a no recourse to public funds attached to them, which means that they can't access any, any public, public fund support. Um, and the self-employed and job retention scheme, despite, I mean, I think they're quite good personally, but they don't, they're not reaching the most vulnerable workers because, for example, the furlough scheme, um, that depends on the goodwill of your employer wanting to put you on furlough. And what we're seeing is employers who simply don't, don't want to, for whatever reason, they either, they can't be bothered or they're doing it, but keeping the money for themselves. And they're just, they're just not, not doing it uh, so that that money is not reaching the workers that it should be reaching. Um, and finally, the, the most unprotected of all, of course, are undocumented women because they have absolutely nowhere to turn to, no support whatsoever. Um, that's, I think, more or less the issues we've been, we've been seeing. Uh, in terms of immigration, you asked for, about the immigration bill, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
so yeah, the immigration bill had its second reading, I think that was last week, all the weeks are kind of merging together at this <laughs> point. <laughs> um, it's quite a concerning piece of legislation for many reasons. Um, it obviously seeks to end free movement for Europeans, but it goes well, well beyond that. And it could have really, really uh, detrimental impact on, on migration in general. Um, on the one hand, it gives the Secretary of State power to amend the bill at any time after it's been approved by Parliament. Um, that's not only dangerous because they could essentially do whatever they want, but it's also a, a really missed opportunity because immigration law is very complex. Um, I mean, I'm a migrant myself and I work on these issues and I struggle to understand it. <laughs> Um, immigration lawyers sometimes struggle to understand it. So you can imagine if you're a migrant who, who, aren't, who isn't fluent in English and, you know, there's just no way, there's just no way to understand it. So this is a missed opportunity because they could have come up with a piece of legislation that's just better for migrants to understand. Um, it obviously, as, you, as I'm sure you know, it introduces a points-based system, um, which is just a bit ridiculous, really, to, to be honest. Um, because the requirements are very, very hard to, to achieve, aren't they? You have to have a, a job offer from a, an approved sponsor. You have to, to have good knowledge of English. Um, and then the, the, salary, the salary threshold and the, the PhD you have to have, it's just, it's just unattainable, unachievable, I think. Uh, and the reason for this is they say they want to attract high-skilled migrants. Um, so they're providing no routes for what they're calling low-skilled migrants, which are in fact just low-paid migrants, um, which is, it's really dangerous because it increases the risk of exploitation by, by a lot. Um, we, know this, we know this for a fact, exploitation is gonna go up, modern slavery is gonna, is gonna increase, uh, trafficking is gonna increase. Um, and it also contributes to the good migrant and bad migrant rhetoric. Um, and who is deserving and who isn't, which is, um, it's, it's dangerous, but it's very much in line with their hostile environment agenda. So it's, it's not um, surprising. Um, the bill also leaves in place two things that are very detrimental uh, for workers' rights. One of them is the illegal working offense. So working as an undocumented migrant in this country is a crime. Um, and the other thing is that is it leaves in place the data sharing agreements. Um, so essentially what that means is if you're a, an undocumented migrant who is working and you're facing exploitation and you report that exploitation, you have no guarantees that you will not be, that the, your immigration information will not be shared with the home office. So you could face uh, deportation and, or, or uh, imprisonment. That this keeps the most vulnerable workers from getting help. We know this for a fact from, from our work, from other organizations' work, um, and this will obviously continue with the, with the new system. And another thing I would say about this bill is that it's, it's I mean, the timing is a bit strange because it seems to completely disregard that public attitude has changed in the last few weeks towards migration, hasn't it? Um, societies seems finally replacing value on, on migrants that, the that those migrants that the government called unskilled or low skilled or just uh, low paid uh, uh, who are actually keeping things going and making life livable for all of us. Great, that's a really good summary of the bill and a lot of the abuses that have been going on recently. So we've talked in previous episodes about how the power relationship is really unequal between workers and employers in general because of the way things like the furlough scheme operate and you've talked about a lot of ways in which for migrant workers that can be even more of a problem particularly if people's immigration status is ambiguous let's say so um just taking that into account what what would you want to see the government do what is laos um, campaigning for to happen in this current situation in terms of Employment or immigration or, or what specifically? So what, what, what are the kind of most urgent changes that you'd want, want to see during the pandemic to government policy? In terms of the pandemic, okay. So what we're advocating for is um, 
the suspension of the no recourse to public funds condition that's a, a big one because a lot a lot of migrant women and migrants in general cannot access public funds and, and can and are not able to go to work at this time so are, have have no income um we want suspension of data sharing um with for immigration purposes because again that's keeping the most vulnerable from reporting crime for example or reporting exploitation um, suspension of all NHS charges and also a campaign so that migrants know that NHS won't charge them if they go into hospital for, for, for any COVID related um, issues or anything else. A scrap on the restriction for the statutory sick pay because at the moment you can only get statutory sick pay if you earn above 120 pounds I think it is. Um, so that as well. Um, an increase of universal credit as well. I think that's the main, those are the main things. And support measures in terms of the economy that reach all workers, because as, as we've talked about, the furlough scheme and the self-employed scheme are not reaching the most vulnerable ones. Great stuff, thanks. Matthew, has anything kind of popped up from what Dolores has said that you'd want to ask more about or probe a bit deeper? I guess the main thing for me, and this might, this might come up a bit later, Sam, but was, was just to ask that, well, I mean, all of these threats that, that you're describing are just um, they're just incredibly like, harmful and, and, and just huge. Um, and obviously, as you've described really nicely, it's really hard for a lot of the women you work with to, to, to actually sort of address these threats without you know, facing even greater risks. So um, just from your perspective, you know, how do you think some of the women you work with and and, and migrant workers in general are, are sort of coming together and actually like standing up for their rights and, and what can we do to, to help them stand up for those rights? Oh, that's a hard question. I think um, one of the main issues at the moment, uh, and it's an issue we're, we're dealing with, is that information is confusing enough if you speak English. Um, so you can imagine if you don't, then knowing what to do in terms of whether you can take public transport or not you can go out or not in terms of how to ask your employer to provide you with ppe if you don't know what you're, you're entitled to it's very hard to do these these things um so it's important for our community and it's been important for our community to stay together to stick together and to share information as widely as possible we've been really uh, trying really hard to, to get all the information out there in our languages in Spanish and, and Portuguese and I think that's being shared very very widely the community seems to be you know sticking together in that in that sense um, they've also been quite active we've been quite active in in raising our voices in general and denouncing everything that's that's going on and luckily it's been picked up by the by the media in the last in the last few weeks so it's become a bit more more known it's given more visibility to to the issues in general that are faced by migrants not just during the pandemic but always they've just been made worse uh, right now so i think in terms of what everyone can do to help these communities is just to keep sharing keep giving visibility keep supporting migrant communities i guess just generally um if there's if there's anything you want to like plug for people who are listening like anything you know anything you want to make them aware of or if there are any really great um, organizations um, out there who are who are doing wonderful work and that they should know about um, like feel free to to share it oh there's loads of great organizations I couldn't name them all um, just if you just to say perhaps if you do uh, know of a local migrant community and you can support them then do it either by sharing their messages or supporting them financially because a lot of them are struggling with with funding at the moment and will be struggling with funding um, in the future. Um, supporting campaigns like the ones that uh, the Joint Council for Welfare of Immigrants are doing is really, really important. Yeah, that's it. I, I mean, we understand that these are really unprecedented times and this is being a challenge for every leader in every country in the world. Um, and for that reason, the pandemic has been called a great equalizer when it's really, really not because some people are a lot more vulnerable than others, as we've, as we've been seeing. Um, but one thing the pandemic has done is given visibility to those workers who were previously invisible. You know, the cleaners, the porters, the bus drivers, the supermarkets, uh, cashiers, people who are keeping things going with meager salaries. Um, 
and all migrants and BME organizations know and have raised quite visibly that the, the measures so far are not reaching these vulnerable communities. So we really want to see the government step up and strive to, to reach these workers. Thanks so much, Dolores. We've really enjoyed hearing all the in interesting insights into the experiences of, of the women that you work with. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for giving us this space. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye. We've heard a lot from um, Dolores about how the struggles that everyone might be going through with things like the furlough scheme or your job being affected in other ways and made it immeasurably worse by things like the hostile environment and the way that migrants are treated differently. So there's a couple of things that I think we should conclude here and Matthew really keen to hear what your take on this is. And it's for me, one thing is that our quote unquote democracy isn't really a full democracy if it's not including really big parts of our communities. And if we think about how migrant communities don't have a voice in the political system, they can't vote, there's little incentive for politicians to listen to the struggles that they're going through. Maybe we need to change our model of citizenship from one that is based on birth, basically, to one that's based on residence, because we're seeing now with, even before the pandemic hit, the Conservatives were making plans to change our constitution to do things like restricting judicial review, which is one of the only ways you can actually defend your rights if you're not represented in the formal political structures. So that's one way I think we should be looking at how things should change after this. Yeah, I definitely agree, Sam. And I think it's really important to, to definitely think about the ways in which um, our democracy necessarily excludes um, lots of different communities and how we can resist that and really turn our democracy into something which includes um, various different communities. Absolutely. And I think the, the other key thing that's come out of this conversation for me is the horrific impacts of the hostile environment. And that's something that was in the news over the last couple of years a little bit, where we were looking at the Windrush generation and how we saw tragic stories of British citizens being deported because of the failures of the Home Office. And then, of course, bringing in that policy from 2011 onwards. But now we're really seeing the impacts of that on a, on a bigger scale. And the public is kind of changing their attitude to some of these issues with things like the NHS surcharge. But ultimately, you know, the, most of these measures are still in place. People are still not seeking health care because of concerns about their immigration status, as we've heard today. And, you know, we certainly need to suspend all of the elements of the hostile environment for the length of the pandemic. And, you know, I, th I think that's something we should be looking towards getting rid of completely in the long term, because it's one of the harshest regimes in the world, when you think about things like the criminalization of undocumented work, that goes even further than places like the United States, which are world renowned for their tough on immigration policies. Definitely. And I think one thing that that really stood out for me in that in that particular episode. So um, we're talking about the uh, just for reference for anyone who hasn't um, picked this up. Uh, some polling that was done by the JCWI, the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, I think it was just last week, but showing that a majority of, of the population of this country were in favour in favor of a much more sort of like inclusive um, framework for immigration and were, were dead set against the hostile environment. And, and yet these terrible policies are, are, are still supported and even, I think, ramped up, made worse by the government. And I think what this shows for me is that migrant phobia, this, this sort of irrational like hatred of, of people from elsewhere, is at its base um, uh, an elite-driven phenomenon. It's something that the establishment really needs to work hard to sustain because you know when we come to crunch points like these most people most people around the country wherever they're from recognize that um that actually they have more in common with other workers who might happen to be migrants than they do with with our rulers and so they have to work really hard to confect this migrant phobia and that's what we're seeing with the immigration bill and that's why that it's being advanced in at the height of a crisis not because it's important but because um, from a sort of, I guess, ideological standpoint, it, the government relies on on the kind of hatred that they can stir up using legislation like this. Um, 
And so in that context, especially, it's, it's really, really important to support um, organizations like Laws who are doing everything they can to, to raise the voices um, of, of workers in migrant communities. So we've really enjoyed speaking to Dolly and speaking to each other on this episode, but now we want to hear from you. What would you like to hear from us on our next episode? Let us know by leaving your comments on social media and by using the hashtag democracy in lockdown. If you're listening to this in the couple of days after it's been released, you've still got time to join us for the final two sessions of our democracy gathering, where we're having conversations about what we should be doing about changing our democracy after the pandemic. So we've got one more session on trade, the NHS, and how that's going to be changed by the pandemic. I'm also having a session on the future of democracy on Friday with Christine Berry and Hilary Wainwright, two great thinkers about how we can really change how we think about democracy and make it far more participatory so you can find that in the show notes too if you're listening afterwards you can still join our email list and find those sessions to watch back again so please do join us in whatever way you can to help us build the new democracy that we need thanks for listening until next week thanks very much matthew bye thanks very much bye thanks for tuning in we'll be coming back next thursday with more Remember, you can reach us on social media and tell us what you think we should discuss next week. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share. Stay home, stay safe.